Ch -ch Check one, two. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. There, uh, if you check the timeline, Time Magazine has a timeline starting from 1812, 200 events that changed the world. In 1969, man landing on the moon. But even with that, is Woodstock. Artie has had four or five careers in his life. Songwriter, record producer, record company executive, promotions, and yeah, that, that festival called Woodstock. When you listen to the man, yeah, it's great. He put on the Woodstock Festival, but he changed culture of America. He changed the culture of the world. This is a man that, that will live forever in history. The reason being is those people of the 60s are called the Woodstock generation. So a big welcome to Artie Kornfeld. The record producer. Okay. Yeah, the record producer. That, you know, I don't, how many times did you work with Lavalier, Mike? Would you mic me, please? Okay. <laughs> I should have introduced myself. I could have done a better job. I could tell you how great, how great. This is my dream. Because for 45 years, I knew that your generation was going to be the one. I knew that. You know, that's why my internet show I have on young bands. If, you know, if any of you have listened to it, you know, with 18 million hits, some of you must have hit it on sooner or later. Um, I lost a child. Uh, while my ex-partners were trying to make money off Woodstock, you know, I never really tried to do that. You know, I didn't have to. I was a writer and a producer. Um, I really was looking for the, the I, I did a lot of college radio in the last couple of years because I wanted to get I wanted to get to you people because uh, I really felt that the way the world is I felt the Woodstock Nation blew it you know that the Woodstock Nation was the war babies and we had the vote and we were the most powerful generation to be and you know and if we would have come out of Woodstock and people hadn't a drop tuned in and, and turned on and stayed turned on we would have had the whole generation. So when I spoke at the uh, Summer of Love anniversary to 100,000 people in San Francisco, I said, Woodstock Nation, kiss my ass. I said, you know, don't complain about what's going on because you did not participate in, this, in the system. You dropped out, you know? So while that was going on, I, I, was, doing, I was working with Neil Young and doing the stuff I do, you know? Um, and Tracy Chapman and a lot of other people which, which I, I got another 50 gold and platinum albums after Woodstock. Uh, but I gave, they all went to charity, by the way. I, I, there's nothing in my house. There's no Woodstock posters. There's no gold records. All that's there is me, the lady I live with, and Boo Boo Cat, you know? <laughs> and Boo Boo Cat's the hippest of all of us. Um, God, Woodstock. Woodstock is, um, it's a, my show is called The Spirit. It was first I called it The Spirit of the Woodstock Nation. And I brought on someone from every band that played at Woodstock. And then one night I just said out of nowhere, I just said, um, and my friend Pat Scully is here with me. I said, you know what? Unknown bands are better than what's on radio. Radio is such payoff. And, and, it, and it's, there's so much corruption in the music industry that the record companies, when I, when I ran record companies, you had to be a hit writer, you had to be a hit artist, you had to be a, a hit producer. And I did all three of those. So when I ran Capital, or when I ran whatever, Mercury, whatever label I ran, I, I was a music person. Now the people that are making the decisions on what's coming out are accountants and lawyers. And, and that's who picks the acts. 
when it comes to radio with the with the big with the big syndicates like Clear Channel and Citadel, uh, you can't get on radio unless you're a big company and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so what I did with the show is I started to play unknown bands or bands on independent labels. And oddly enough, the show took off to the point where in the last, in the last two months, we wound up getting 30,000 hits from Beijing and 5,000 hits from Hong Kong. And that lit, for the first time, Tokyo came in. And it's been all, it's in 101 countries now with 18 million hits. And it's all because of the, of the young bands having a chance. Now, you want to know about Woodstock? What do you want to know about Woodstock? Uh, How about starting when you were a writer? Let's, you had an amazing writing career. Well, a hit songwriter. Well, I, my first record came out when I was 16. Um, I was an all-state symphony trumpet player. I, I played first chair. I, I won the New York uh, I Speak for Democracy concert. I was always able to communicate. My folks moved a lot, and I went to 16 schools. So I had to learn how to get it know people real quick. And I think that's what gave me the ability to write. And I wound up writing about 34 songs that made the top 100 and about 15 that made the top 50 and, and, and about four that made the top 10 and a couple that went number one. But um, writing, uh, I was very lucky. I, 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 I did a record at 16. I didn't even know it came out and then uh, I found out it came out. Uh, my name was Jess Wild. I changed my name to Jess Wild, W-Y-L-D-E. And, uh, and uh, I ran a youth group, so I booked myself every week to play. <laughs> you know, before that, I was playing jazz. I was, I was actually making money playing jazz in clubs, you know, in a jazz, in a jazz trio. Um, and I was lucky because I got signed to Evan, Nevin's Kirsten Music and Screen Gems. That's like going to Oxford. I mean, if you were, you were with Donnie Kirshner and you were a Screen Gems writer, you were with Carol King and Jerry Goffin and Barry Mann and Cynthia Weil and Neil Sedaka and Brian Wilson, who I wrote with, and Jan Berry. And it was, it was like a candy shop. I mean, it was like going to school. And what a great school to go to because within the first what happened was I met Jan from Jan and Dean, may his soul rest in peace. To tie academics in with music, when Jan was Jan and Dean and doing Surf City and all that stuff, he was the number one student at the UCLA Medical School. He was sending in his papers from the road. That's how brilliant Jan was. The, when I wrote, the, the fact that Dead Man's Curve came true, if any of you know the story of the song that Brian and I wrote, it, it was a song, it was a song about and Brian Wilson and I from the Beach Boys are on a, he, he wrote Hey Little Honda, so they gave him like a 60cc Honda. And I'm riding with Brian in Santa Monica, and there's all sand on the ground there. I said, Brian, you got to slow down. <laughs> and he, he speeds it up, and we go over, and the bike breaks in half. And we were about a, half a mile from where his future mother-in-law was. And, and we go carrying half a bike each, bleeding like crazy, and we walk in the door, and there's the piano, there's a piece of paper. For some reason, I just write Dead Man's Curve. I have no idea why. And everybody thinks it's about a car race, but I actually, it was about, it was about Robert Frost's poem, Two Roads in the Woods. And it was about the choices that you have to face every day in life, you know? And if you make the wrong choice, you've blown it. Either you blow a relationship, or you blow a business deal, or you might lose your life, you know? You may make the wrong decision. You may take that one oxy, that you don't want to take, you know? Anyway, when Jan had the accident and Brian called me and said, Artie, it came true, you know? Because he thought I was nuts. I, I, he wrote Rolling Stone, Artie wrote Dead Man's Curve. When, when Jan had the accident, when he ran his Corvette under a, an 18 wheeler, 16 wheeler, and it took the top of his brain off, um, and then he, he did come back, you know, and uh, he was, he was uh, a vegetable for like 16 years. And I, and I saw him, I'm sober, I'm sober 32 years. And I'm a founder of CA, one of the founders of CA. Uh, that's Cocaine Anonymous. Uh, seemed to run in the music business drugs. It just sort of came with it. Because you're young and you happen real quick and people come around you. And after Woodstock, forget it. It was so hard for my wife and I to just stay sober. 
because everybody wanted to get close to you, you know? And what was the way they used? Drugs. But uh, my daughter Ovi was, always went to private school. We always had nice houses to live in. Uh, and I work real hard, you know, and that's why. Uh, Woodstock is, um, Woodstock is now, this is Woodstock. This is really Woodstock. You, you people in, that are in college now, you kids, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm about as mature as a 12-year-old, so <laughs> you're probably older than me. <clears throat> but you really have the ball, and <clears throat> I've been saying it for years, wait till that generation comes around, and they're in college now. And, they, it's, and I said it's going to take four or five generations after the Woodstock Festival. It's going to take four or five decades till there's going to be a generation to come and straighten out the mess that the last four generations have made. You know, and it's really you people have the ball. It's really, it's really you. If you if you if you stay on the road and you and you go right down 95. You know, and you're going to wind up, you're going to wind up, you're making a change. And if you just make a change with yourself, you're making a change to the world. Um, I'm no philosopher. I'm a, just a songwriter. <laughs> and and, and whatever, whatever else. You want to know about Woodstock? You want to know about how it happened? Yes. Let's start, let, yeah, let's start with uh, the day Mike Lang walked in your office well, at Capitol. it goes, okay. <laughs> I, I'm 20... I'm 23 and a half, and I've already written 32 chart songs, already run three record labels, and I'm only 23. And I was a president of my college class, and I played base, varsity baseball. <laughs> I had already, I'd already done that. And then everybody knew, because I was a student, I knew all the musicians, and, and, and I produced a lot, that the door was always open at Capitol. When I took over Capitol, the door was always open if Artie's there. So my secretary says, um, there's someone here to see you named Michael Lang, okay? And uh, I said, does he have an appointment? And she said, no. And uh, I said, well, set him up for tomorrow because I'm really tied up. I got to listen to these tapes and I got to go to the studio. And then she comes back, he says, well, tell him I'm from Bensonhurst. Well, Bensonhurst is the area of Brooklyn that I lived in when I was a kid. So I let him in and it was immediate friendship, you know? It wasn't his story. I was sitting on the desk smoking hash and all that stuff. That's bullshit. I was actually sitting in a suit with a razor cut, and he came in. I had Bert Summer, who was in the record hair, and my friends had already written hair, and they were the stars of hair, Ray, Rado and Ragney, who did hair. And um, Michael came in, and his head shop had been busted in Florida, and he was broke. So for a year and a half, he stayed with me, actually on Sutton Place, and he stayed with me at my house. And I sort of supported him. And um, one night, about 3 in the morning, we were smoking some good Colombian and uh, <laughs> staring out the window because I was on the 38th floor. And it was the highest building. And at that point, it was the highest you know, residential building in New York. And you could see forever. And he says, you know, Artie, you, you're really jaded. I said, what are you talking about, Michael? He said, you never go to concerts anymore. I said, well, Michael. I've been in this business now since I'm 16, you know, and I've seen concerts, and I, and I, I was on the Sonny and Cher, I Got You Babe tour. I played for over 10,000 people 22 times. I know what it's like. I've done it, Michael. Oh, I did have a hit record as a singer, yeah. So uh, then I said, well, what if we took a Broadway theater, you know, and uh, I have money, you don't have money. Well, I'll use whatever I have. We'll book an act, and we'll make it free. And we'll have a donation thing on the way out if people want to leave money. And let's see how long we can make it go. And then Michael said, well, you know, I was in Florida, and we tried to do, uh, we tried to do a Miami pop thing with Jimmy. But what happened was it rained, and we had to call it off. The Miami pop festival that happened wasn't Michael's. It, a millionaire liked the idea, and two months later, he put on a Miami pop festival, and it, it ran for three days. But I like the name Festival. And then we were talking about, and we said, well, then my wife out of nowhere said, to let my late wife, uh, who had as much to do with creating Woodstock as Michael and I, 
said, well, what if you took it outside? And my head went, boing. Took it outside, huh? I said, Michael, what do you think? How many think we'd have if we took this thing outside? And we got all the acts we could. He said, 50,000 people. He said, Artie, what do you think? I said, well, maybe 100. And I said, Linda, what do you think? She said, over 300,000, just like that. And I sort of looked off the terrace, and you know, I could see forever. I could see all the way to LaGuardia Airport. And I was on 56th Street. I could see it into Queens, and I could see the Empire State Building the other way. And uh, I actually sort of had a vision of this field. You know? And that's, that's why in the movie, people say, boy, were you stoned? I was not stoned. I was just so blown away by what I saw in front of me that this actually really came true, that this was really happening. Of course, the, what was really going on, the movie was my baby. And the, I'll tell you how the movie happened, if you want to know. You, you want to bring in uh, uh, Joel and John? Oh, Joel and bit. John. OK, what happens is, so we talk about this. And I'm running capital. Michael stay with me. And once in a while, he goes up to Woodstock to see his girlfriend who's living up there. And uh, a lawyer named Miles Laurie, who we knew, said, you know, there's an ad in the New York Times that says, two guys, unlimited capital. And uh, we never read that. A lawyer told us. So what they wrote in the book is a lie. We never saw that ad. But I called him up. And you know, John Roberts was, was the heir to Block Pharmaceuticals, who sold to Johnson & Johnson. And he was a real gentleman. Joel Rosenman, who is Joel Rosenman. <laughs> and uh, we went and met them, went meet them. And they wrote in their book. Michael didn't say a word. but. They respected me because I had money and I was, I was running a big co company. So we made the deal for $250,000 to do a festival. And uh, that's how Joel and John came in, you know. And, uh, and Woodstock Ventures was born. No, well, we, we, we put together Woodstock Ventures. I couldn't take my stock because in my, I had a five-year contract and I was going to be the next president of capital. I couldn't take, I couldn't take my stock in Woodstock Ventures yet because I would have been sued because I, had a, I couldn't compete. When you sign with a label, they make you sign a non-compete clause. And I couldn't compete against, uh, you know, with another entertainment thing against capital. Uh, Silence is golden. <laughs> uh, so you guys moved ahead with this. Uh, no, so what happened was Michael said to me, Artie, you know i never done this. i got to be away from John and Joel. He says, you know how to promote. You've had all these hit records. He said, you handle the promotion. I'll handle. I'll, I don't know. I've never done it, but I'll handle the building and all that stuff. He said, but i got to have an office you know, away from Joel and John, because if they watch over me, We'll never get this thing off the ground because I'm never going to be able to come in under budget, you know. Actually, he came in 600 percent over budget, and we spent 2.4 million to do the festival instead of 250 thousand. But you know what? Every partner was needed. Like when, of all people, and they were friends of mine, the airplane and the dead, who were really good friends of mine, and uh, the airplane, the dead, and and the who, and I can't stand Peter Townsend, so that was OK. <laughs> you know, his attitude to, to me, uh, you know. Anyway, um, they, they, refused, they, they said they couldn't go on. They wouldn't go on unless uh, they got cash. And it's a good thing we had John Roberts' father, because he got the Bank of Monticello to open on the weekend, on a Sunday, and, and give him the cash. I said to, I said to my friend, uh, Rock Scully, who managed the dead, I said, how could the dead hold us up here when this could be a riot? Because at that point, you know, it had, I'll, I'll get to the rain and what the rain did, OK? I couldn't believe that these acts wanted the money. So that's where Joel and John, Joel was on the site twice. John was never there. Um, so those were the two guys with unlimited capital. Now, Michael did hire the best he could find in the world. Chip Monk was the best lighting director. Bill Hanley did the best sound. Um, and he had a staff of 1,600 people there. And where I appreciated what Michael did was really when the rain hit. Because when the rain hit is when the miracle happened. Because everybody was threatened. Now, we were threatened because we had people's lives in, in our hands at that point. If those towers went over and people were killed, you know, 
It was on us. I mean, I, I couldn't even live with myself. And it was a violent rain. It was, it was really a violent rain with like 40 mile an hour winds and, and the tarpaulins flying all over the place and the towers shaking and people on the towers and saying, get off the towers, please. And it was really a violent rain. And then my friend Barry Melton from Country Joe and the Fish, he was, he was the fish in Country Joe and the Fish. Mm -hmm. And people don't know it, he was one of the top, he was a top public defender in Yolo County, California, the whole time he was in Country Joe and the Fish. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot behind some of these musicians aside from just music. Uh, he started saying, no more rain. And people started chanting, no more rain. And the rain stopped. <laughs> and then the mudslide took over. <laughs> and then, of course, I had to do the mudslide. And I did the mudslide, and I got all dirty. And, uh, but I had a trailer behind <laughs> Me and Michael had trailers behind the stage. So we, but I, but it, what did, good did it do, because all of our friends, what are you going to say to your friends? You can't come in out of the rain? You know, so uh, the rain is when the miracle happened, because the threat to everybody pulled everybody together as one. Like Van Morrison said, everybody pulled as one as we sailed into the mystic. And that's what happened. We sailed into the mystic at that point. Everybody. And, and I, everybody on that field was as important as everybody backstage. They really were, and I really am not just saying that, I really believe that. Because when, when people ask me who produced Woodstock, I said Woodstock produced Woodstock. You know, Woodstock was a miracle. Michael was an idiot to try to do Woodstock two and three. You can't repeat a miracle. I never tried to do it. I never tried to make money off it. I, I, I've spoken a, a lot of times. I've only taken money twice from two huge universities. And uh, I've done so many. I, I decided I was going to keep Woodstock alive. So I'm, I was very, Bruce Moses here. And Bruce knows how powerful I was at rock radio. So what I did is, and, and I would, uh, when I had records, like, like records we worked on, like Tracy Chapman, I would, I would tell them, like, oh, when I had Survivor, I took this unknown band, Survivor, and I took them all the way to Eye of the Tiger. They were unknown when I signed them. And, and, and um, I would do interviews, and I'd give away a Woodstock poster, and I'd just do the interviews on Woodstock. And I did that for almost, for almost 45 years, until now until I got my own show that got bigger than the, the, the radio shows. Because I was really knew that it had to go on to the, the next generations. And then when, the, what really, when it went through the roof is when Time Magazine had the list of the 20 greatest accomplishments of mankind. And I'm not bragging about this because it blows my mind like it blows yours. It said number one was landing on the moon. And number two, it said the Woodstock Music and Art Fair the greatest man-made peaceful event in the history of all mankind. And they had that as a number two accomplishment. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. You know, now, I was one, I lived in Levittown, and I lived 10 blocks from Jonas Salk. Now, to me, he, he created the polio vaccine, and nobody even knows his name, hardly. And Jonas Salk saved how many millions of lives? over the, all these years, you know? I thought he should have been on that list, and he wasn't, you know? So, you know, that's what I thought. But, you know, I, I've been to India. You won't believe around the world what's happening, because they're into rock. Like, they're like into hair rock to the rock of the 70s, you know, in the 80s. And like in India, and in Korea, and in Italy. You know, that, that's really where they're at. And they're just really getting into Woodstock. It's really crazy. They're berserk in, other, in, the, in the countries around the world now about Woodstock. When I went to India, I did every show. I was on VH1 every night. I was, in, I was on the cover of the London Times. It was crazy. It was like, um, because it represents a hope, a hope, a hope for freedom. You know, people say, what's your favorite part of the movie, right? And they think I'm going to say Alvin Lee. Or me with the flower in my hand, you know, which, you know, I, I'm proud of that scene because I really said, told the truth. And uh, my favorite scene in the Woodstock movie is when I saw a guy take a bite out of the sandwich and pass it to the guy, girl next to him who passed it to the guy next to her. And that's really what Woodstock was all about. That sandwich represented to me 
what Woodstock was about. You know, and um, something recently happened that, that reminded me of, of, of the same thing, uh, which slipped my mind right now. T tell a little bit about the promotion, how that how, oh, you, you promotion? lost your sight twice. Yeah, you know what? And it, it wasn't, honestly, and this is not to toot my own horn, I knew how to promote, and it wasn't just word of mouth. I, had, I met with the Black Panthers, I met with the Weathermen, I, met, I had friends in SDS, I was friends with Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin, and I went all around the country and I made deals with every militant group that could cause trouble at Woodstock. And all they wanted was legal protection if they got busted, they wanted medical protection if they got hurt, and they wanted food if we ran out of food. That was it, including the Black Panthers. And it was a scary meeting, that first meeting. I was very scared, I was. Now, my mother, my mother founded the Freedom Rides. If you, when, if you read my book, you'll see a letter from the Congress of Racial Equality, and it, and it says that every Afro-American owes Shirley Kornfeld a debt of thanks because without her founding the Freedom Rides with Vernon Jordan, integration would have been pushed back 20 years in America. Now, this was 12 years before Martin Luther King even came out. So I'm very proud of my mother, May I saw rest in peace. She's gone about a year and a half now. Uh, the Black Panthers did show up, you know, and uh, uh, it was really sort of crazy. I was, it, I was on, it was my call of duty. And we only had a line separating backstage, and for some reason, no one out of, the real count was, the last count was from a helicopter, 532,000, including the outlying farms. On the field, 390,000, but in the woods and all around, 530,000. Nobody crossed that line. So the Black Panthers showed up with chains, and it was very scary. And, you know, <laughs> it was scary. I was scared. You know, I was scared. Uh, but I was calm, because the vibe there was so beautiful, you, you couldn't really be that scared, you know. And uh, I said, what do you guys want? He said, no one's going to tell. I said, listen, guys, this is, look what's going on here. You got sliced stone. You got... You got, it's in, look at the crowd, it's multicolored. This is, what you're, this is what you're fighting for. What do you want? They said, well, we don't want anybody telling us where we could park our bikes. We want to park our bikes over that line in the backstage area. So I said, you know what? Why don't you park your bikes in the backstage area? Because I'm not stopping you, that's for sure. <laughs> and you know what? I never, I never heard one other thing. When it was all over, the bikes were gone and there was no trouble with any Black Panther at all, you know, which is ridiculous because at Altamont, they hired the Hells Angels, you know, and, and, some, and I knew that was going to happen because they sent me tickets. Michael went. I refused to go. I knew what was going to happen. I, am, I, I can heal, and I am clairvoyant, <laughs> and that's a fact. It just really is. You know? were, you, were you ever scared during the, th you know, even going into it, going, oh my God, what if something happens here? Oh, I thought I'd be in jail for manslaughter for the rest of my life. <laughs> no, I wanted to go to the Bahamas, actually, two days before. I was really scared. Of course I was. Because I, I knew it was coming. Uh, the promotion, okay, I knew, I knew all the program directors of the radio stations around the country. So I picked 50 guys that were friends of mine, because I had a very limited budget. Because Michael was going through so much money, my budget kept shrinking and shrinking. So I went, I, I, wrote, I wrote every word in those ads were picked out, you know. And I went to all these cities and I made special deals with the program directors. I, I gave them 100 bucks, which was a lot to them in, in 69 extra, because they didn't make a lot. And, uh, and I let them produce their own commercials. But I said, this is what you have to say. And, and, and then, and for that, I got, I got, I paid like one tenth of what a record company would pay for that time, because I picked my slots. Like I even planned when the summer was coming, what time you would get to the beach, what time you put out your blanket, and what time you would turn on your radio. I actually thought that out. So I, I hit, I hit morning drive when people were going to work, to get the older crowd. I, afternoon drive, I hit the beach time about 10 o'clock when I knew people would be listening to radios. And, it, it, and I had a great staff. Danny Goldberg, who started, you know, you know about Air America, right? Air America is where Rachel Maddow started, and it was, it was really freeform, progressive radio. He was on the staff. Uh, 
Jane, Jane Friedman, who managed Michelle Schock, who's a great singer from Canada. Um, I had a great staff. And I had people that did my time buys. And then we ran out of money. And it was it, my anniversary to my late wife was coming up. And it was May 31st, the anniversary, May, June, July, August, three months before. All we had was Sly Stone book, and I knew we were going under. You know, because Michael, for some reason, decides to build a site without getting a permit from Walk Hill, and we lose the site and we're broke. So I had X amount of dollars left. So I wanted to find out, where do I spend this money? Because I don't really feel that, that, it's, that it's people living in communes and people living on the street that are coming to Woodstock. I think it's college kids that are coming. So I wrote an ad, and I hired the ticket guy from the, from Bill Graham from the Fillmore, and I pressed, I printed up about 200,000 tickets. And I didn't expect to sell anything, but I said, let's put a coupon on there and, and, and sell it for $18, I think it was, for three days, and just see what happens. Well, 100,000 people answered, and, and we took in, we cleared, after it cleared, uh, we had a million five. So that gave the money to, to take it at least to the point where, my, where Michael couldn't get the fences up, but at least we had, we had a site, you know. Um, believe me, I love, I, 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 after Woodstock 3, I didn't talk to Michael for 10 years, because Woodstock is very precious to me and very pristine. And Woodstock 2 and 3, you know, he wanted me to be at Woodstock 3, and I made him pay me 50 grand just to be there with him. You know, Woodstock 3, I couldn't take, so we didn't talk for 10 years. Now we're best friends, you know. I mean, we acknowledge that we're the best friend that each of us has. We share a secret. We say something that I can't explain to you that we share that happens, that happens somewhere in the cosmos together and with Linda. And, it's, and it keeps us, uh, I'm probably his best friend and he's probably my best friend. You know, no matter what our differences was. Uh, the, the, the only difference we had, the trouble is when he met me, I had already happened. And he kept saying, I wish I could write songs and produce and this and that. And when he went back, when they went back to do Woodstock 2, and I heard about it, and they came to me and I said, how could you have Pepsi-Cola and a record company, Polygram Records, and call it a Woodstock? It's everything that Woodstock was against. You can't do that. And when I went there, I saw why. God Almighty, the, uh, Peter Gabriel's a friend of mine. So I was hanging with Peter Gabriel at, at the time. The sodas were ten, $7 each. You couldn't bring your own tent. You had to buy it from Woodstock Ventures. They spent $75 million building the site. I've been to India. I know what it's like. I mean, I set up a food bank in India to, just to feed 15,000 people in the streets by collecting you know, food from the restaurants and hotels at the end of the day and then packaging it and putting it out in the morning with an actor named Jackie Shroff. If you look him up, he's like the Marlon Brando of India. And I, I was just thinking, how could you spend 75000 And John Roberts said to me, Million. when he saw how much they were going to lose, they lost about $125 million on that concert. John Roberts and I was sitting up, because I was, they put me in the motel right next to Michael. I had the room right next to him even though I wasn't involved, and I was sitting with John Roberts, may his soul rest in peace, who I really liked. He was a real gentleman. And uh, he said to me, Artie, but look at the infrastructure. Isn't it beautiful? And I said, John, yeah, the infrastructure is really beautiful, but the bottom line is this has nothing to do with Woodstock. It's a ripoff. He said, you really think so? I said, yeah, you're selling Pepsi-Colas for $7. People can't buy tent, have their own tents. They got to buy them from Woodstock Ventures. It's everything that we were against, but you don't know because you weren't involved in that side mm -hmm. when we did the first one. So, uh, but you know what? It took all four. Woodstock would not have happened without all four partners. There's no way it would have happened, no way at all. You want to talk about some of the acts that got booked and little John Sebastian story too? We'd like well, to hear that. I, I got stories about all the acts, but. Uh, <laughs> Because the movie was my baby, and the deal the acts had was they would get paid a fee, and then they'd get half, if they were gonna be shot by a camera, they'd get 50% more to be filmed. So I just sat there with a pad, and every act, you know, first I had to cool them out and tell them, 
you can't do anything to incite anybody when you go on stage. You know, that's why you hear Arlo Guthrie saying, they just told me the New York Thruway is closed, but if you look at the scene before, it's me and Arlo to walking over, and I'm just told them the New York Thruway is closed. But I, I just wrote out, how much do you want to do the film? I just write out, we will pay you so-and-so to be filmed, we will pay you so-and-so to be filmed. And I had them all sign releases that I wrote up. They, they weren't even printed. I wrote up, you have the right to film us, you know, we'll negotiate the final price if the movie comes out, you know. And everybody signed except Richie Havens. And Richie was a friend of mine when we were both broke in 1962, you know, and he was making $15 a night to play. Um, Peter Townsend gave me a hard time, and we had a little shoving match, but he did sign, you know, and uh, the funny thing is, if you notice in the movie, this is a secret, you notice Richie Havens, you always, it's always looking up at him. Richie didn't sign, didn't want to be filmed, and Wiley's a great, obviously a great cinematographer. Direct, the director. He sh and the director, he sh but if, I'm talking about cameraman now. Yeah. He shot Richie, he was standing right next to me. He shot him without looking through the lens from his waist up, that's why all the shots of Richie Havens are up his nose. <laughs> because he, he, was, he shot him without Richie knowing. I mean, I'm sure Richie's happy because it gave him 40 more years of work before he died, you know. In fact, everybody in that movie, I don't think Country Joe would have lasted. I don't know if Santana would have happened. I don't know if any of those acts would have happened if that movie didn't play for 40 years. I mean, because they're all friends of mine. I've had every act had someone on my show. You know, and it's like um, Woodstock gave them 40 edit. And also, this was the point where AM was switching into FM. So that was the crossover point where rock radio really took off. Right, Moshe? Yeah. Around 69? Yeah, that was definitely a turning point. Yeah, that was the turning point where radio started to play rock. You know, and the, and the AM stations played pop. Now, I love the AM stations because my songs that I wrote were pop, were during the pop era. You know, when they went to the 70s, I was glad there were satellites because I still get royalties, you know. But um, it's, it's amazing how there wasn't one fist fight in three and a half days. Not one fist fight. Could you imagine if there was, if it was a drinking crowd instead of a pot smoking crowd? <laughs> And to tell you the truth, and as far as the drug rap, that was the press, you know. Don't forget, I did take Richard Nixon head on, and he was trying to stop it. There were, there were people on the field that we had to watch that were planted to try to cause trouble, and we had it covered, you know. I mean, uh, I got dosed at Woodstock. Me and my wife got dosed towards the end, the last night, and I had never taken a psychedelic. And I asked Osley, of all people, I asked the Dead's Road manager, who had a reputation for making acid, I asked him, do you have a diet pill or something? Because I've been working three days and I'm going to fall over. And I got stuff to do. And the, I, I was, the band was playing, and I was sitting on Robbie Robinson's amp, and because uh, I could sit wherever I wanted to. <laughs> it, it, was, it was my f stage. So uh, and, and I'm hearing music, and it's so great. I never heard it so good. This music was incredible. I couldn't believe how great. This is fucking incredible. <laughs> what great music. It's incredible. All of a sudden, I see paratroopers dropping down, shooting people. I see the stage on fire. I see, I see hell and damnation. So I, I, I say to Linda, we got to get out of here. So we walk to the back, and we sit down. Michael comes over, and he, and he tries to talk me down. He says, Artie. If we both go, and you're going to get me tripped out now, if you keep talking, he says, I can't take it. I'm going to try to get you help. So I wound up, my wife and I went to the medical tent, and they gave me some Thorazine. And uh, I came out of it. I was only out for about a half hour. And I heard, I, I did, and I heard Jimmy, who was a friend of mine, because Jimmy and, and Buddy Miles, this is Jimmy Hendrix's belt that he gave me three weeks before he died. I've been wearing it ever since, the same belt. And uh, they were friends of mine. I heard Jimmy. Hit a, just hit a cord, and that took me out of the, the medical tent. And that's why on that poster, the guy with the, t t the towel over him and with the beard and the curly hair is me. 
right on stage, and, that, and that's a famous poster. You know, I, I have a shirt at home. He only made 70, and I got one of them. It's Jimmy, and it's just, and me right next to him. And he gave them to his friends, and he gave me one. I also have a bottle of Jimi Hendrix vodka, which people have offered me $4,000 for, you know. And that's one thing I kept, my Jimi Hendrix vodka bottle. And I don't drink, so it'll be there forever. Uh, what else? You want to talk about um, Rich Sargent's here. Oh, you asked me about Sebastian. Pardon? Why did Sebastian? Oh, okay, so tell us okay. about And then Rich Sargent's here, because I want to talk to you about the cow sills, because that is a huge... Well, that's Dang. another. That's all of the story. I know, but we want to hear about you. Well, you, right now we're into Woodstock. All right, so we'll do Sebastian. do Sebastian. Do Sebastian. Uh, do Sebastian. I would go there after. You know. All right, do Sebastian. Oh, Sebastian. I, well, I had the Love and Spoonful. You know, the reason the Love and Spoonful went off the, ra the the British came, and I was a cow. The British had the entire top ten, right, Mo? They had the they had the top ten. There was no American bands happening. And I was working for Charles Koppelman, who just sold his, his chairman of the board ship back to Martha Stewart, and who was chairman of the board of EMI. And Charlie discovered me. He was my mentor. He's the one who got me into capital. I mean, he, Charlie, and we just reunited again on the phone, uh, on Facebook and on the phone again after not talking for 10 years. Anyway, I had the spoonful. I was a director of a and for the company. And... John was there as my guest, and he was sitting with my wife, Linda, under a tarpaulin because it was drizzling. And he had dropped acid. My wife hadn't, you know. And he had dropped acid because John took acid. And um, Timmy Harden, who wrote Reason to Believe, was, was an artist of mine. So I said to Timmy, Timmy, can I borrow your guitar? He said, why? He said, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get John to go on stage. He said, he won't do it. I said, yes, he will. So I walked over, to, I, I pulled the tarpaulin back. He said, John, you're on next. He said, what are you talking about? What do you mean I'm on next? I'm just coming on, man. I can't go out there. What are you, crazy? And, and, and Sebastian's so mellow. I couldn't believe it. This is Sebastian freaking out. I actually pulled him out. I give him the guitar. And I actually push him towards the stage. And that's why when he gets up there, you see in the movie, he forgot the words because he was out of his fucking head. <laughs> But you know, he but he did he did pull it together and he sang Younger Generation, you know. But at the beginning, he couldn't remember the words, and it was it's so precious to see it. In fact, when Governor Pataki, he threw a dinner for me and Michael. There was a big thing at the museum, a Woodstock thing at the museum, and then he had a dinner for me and Michael at the governor's mansion. And Sebastian, uh, Melanie sang, and Melanie, I, Melanie, I, I got her a record deal, and I knew Melanie a long time, and. Uh, and then John was just there as a guest. He came with me and, and Michael. And uh, the governor said, John, why don't you sing for us? He said, no, I don't want to sing. I don't want to sing. And, and, and he said, they said, come on, just, just, sing, um, just, just, just sing anything. So he took Melanie's guitar, and he played, um, and a young a girl keeps going across my mind. And then he, then he stopped. And then the governor said, the governor's now sitting on the floor, and I'm sitting in the governor's chair on the side of the stage. And everybody yells. He says, uh, do one more, John. Well, he said, well, what do you want to hear? And they all yelled, welcome back, Cotter. And John just turns and looks right in my eyes and says, what do you want, Artie? He said, magic. And I'll sing the last verse and chorus with you. And that's what happened. He sang, do you believe in magic? And, and, and I sang the last verse and chorus. So I, I love John Sebastian. He's one of the nicest human beings he also gave me the first joint of my life. <laughs> he really did, in, my, in the office. I said, John, that stuff you're smoking, I think I want to try that. Next day, I was getting a half a pound. <laughs> Just remember, I lived in Coconut Grove, Florida during the early 70s. So I've had more than a half a pound. <laughs> Should I ask him that? On, on I'm Thursday? only joking about it, but I know what a ton looks like. <laughs> uh, why don't you ask me some questions? Because I'm, I'm running out. What, 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 Artie? Why don't you ask them if they have any questions? And why don't, well, you want to know about the castles? The castles is just a song I wrote in a group I... It's a great song. I went into Mercury Records. I put out Wild Thing. I was real hot. 
I put out Wild Thing and I put out Walk Away Renee, and they were both favors. Nobody wanted the records. I put out Wild Thing because my friend who produced The Kinks, Denny Cordell, produced it. Nobody wanted it. And my friend Chip Taylor, who's John, John Voigt's brother, he wrote it, and I pushed that out. And Walk Away Renee was my string, my string contractor when I needed a string, son, Mike Brown. And he was a friend of my artist, Bert Summer. And so I pushed out Walk Away Renee, and then I put out Sunny by Barbie Hebb. And I was real hot, you know, I was real hot. And um, th I went to Mercury, and, and then they assigned me this kid group, the Cowsells. The president says, you got to produce this group, the, the Cowsells. And I said, they're kids. What are you, crazy? I mean, I can't produce these kids. They're like the oldest ones, 14 at the time. So I work with them for a year, and then I go on, I have to go because some one of my acts is playing in England or something. I come back, and they had a meeting, and they dropped the castles. And I just started to hear their harmonies, how great they were, and that if I wrote the song, they could happen. So when they, I had a family and everything. When they dropped the castles, I walked in and tore up my contract and said, I quit. I gave up my income and everything on principle. And, and I had some money left, and I rented this big house in Newport Harbor, that house that's on the, the uh, Council's album cover. And um, I started writing with my partner, May Soul Rest in Peace, Steve Duboff, because we wrote a lot of hits. We wrote 34 hits together. No, 32, the, I, two I wrote with other people, but 32 hits. And um, I don't know where it happened, but for some reason we sat down at the piano and I just created this thing. I saw her sitting in the park, raindrops falling on her. and it, and. I took it up and I taught it to the kids. And the kids had a way, they were family, you know, and there's something with families, like the Bee Gees, right? Um, it, the vocal cords are very similar. So the harmonies that you get out of brothers, like the Bee Gees guy, and they were friends of mine, and I miss the guys that are gone. And, um, God, this is a lot of, this is hard, because there's a lot of memories. And it was funny, because when Dead Man's Curve hit number one, I went to Donnie Kirshner and said, I want to get a Stingray, so I want an advance against my royalties. I got a 427 convertible. It was $2,800 in 1964 when I bought it. But I had a bad back, and I couldn't use the clutch, so after two months, I had to sell it and take a $200 loss. Uh, so I said, I said, if we write the song, Steve, uh, they're going to be huge, because I believe in, that America is founded on the family. And they, there's nothing wrong with apple pie and coffee, too, OK? And not everything has to be hip. Some things just have to be straight ahead the way it really is at home. And uh, we wrote The Rain in the Park. And actually, we wrote every song on that first album. And I put the kid's name on a couple because I wanted to build them. And you know, I wanted to build their names, that they were more than just kids. And they didn't play on the records. And, and, and I arranged it with Jimmy Wisner and Steve all the songs, and um, it just came out. It came out the same day the Bee Gees released their first record, and that stopped around in the 50s, the, the mining disaster. Have you seen my wife, Mr. Jones? Great track. Well, that bombed. And the Castle's record was around 45, and all of a sudden we get the Ed Sullivan show, which was, you know, that was like big. And uh, it was really funny because I knew Ed and Sylvia. I knew them both, actually. And so he let me come in, and, and they never allowed this, except probably for the Beatles. But I actually spent two hours mixing you know, what was going to happen. And it's a live show. And what happens is you know, it, it starts with an organ, and then you hear, I saw her sitting in the park. And then I'll tell you about the rain, and I'll finish the story. That's going to crack you up. And I do a perfect mix. It sounds just like the record. And now the cow shows. Okay, now all of a sudden I hear, and I hear an organ, beep, beep, and nothing else. One of the guys kicked the cord out that was the whole sound system. So for 20 seconds was total insanity in the control room. And I thought it was an hour. I thought the song was over. Finally, someone noticed that the cord was out, and then all of a sudden, it was only 20 seconds. It right when raindrops falling, and it came in full. The record jumped like 30 points the next week and was almost like top 10. And, 
You want and, some and I had two? turned down producing the monkeys. I turned them down. I produced Davy Jones before the monkeys. And I didn't want to do a, a, a bunch of actors sitting pretending they're a band, so I turned it down. I knew, I knew the money involved, but I turned it down anyway. And um, so it was sort of funny when the Calzos knocked Daydream Believer out of number one. You know, it was sort of like a Vindication. And what was, it, what, what was that? This funny, the part about what? That was really hysterical? Oh, the rain is crazy. Okay, I finished the whole mix. It's incredible. Now I called. I called. You know, I I was at the record plant in New York, and you know the record plant is it's it's a famous famous. You wouldn't believe the stuff that was cut there, you know, right? You just wouldn't oh, believe was, all this stuff, yeah. you know. And uh, I have two hundred different rain samples, and I'm listening, and I can't find the rain. I want. I can't find the rain. So I said, I don't know. Am I going to change the title or? What am I going to do about this? Uh, it was called I Love the Flower Girl up to this point, by the way. It wasn't called The Rain, The Park, and other things. And I'll tell you why it was changed. It was called I Love the Flower Girl. As they're wheeling, I said, send these tapes back. I take a look, and I see one tape, and it says, bacon frying in a pan. And I think to myself, because I'm a producer, I say, I wonder if we slow that down, bacon in a pan, what it would sound like. It just might sound like rain. Now, we didn't have the equipment to slow stuff down, but there was a trick, and I'm going to tell you. If you took a mic stand and took the tape off and you took it around, it would slow down, mm -hmm. it would slow down what you were doing. So I took the, actually, right onto the stereo, onto the mix, because it was all mixed, the record. I just didn't have the rain, and sure enough, there was the rain. Now, I blew the council's mind, because they did a documentary, and they didn't know this, so when they came out, Johnny Calcer was playing with the Beach Boys, and I told him, and I blew his mind. And then when the brothers, they, their family didn't know, when I told them it wasn't rain on their record, I freaked them out totally. <laughs> that the whole, their whole life they were living on bacon frying in a pan. <laughs> but you know, if you're a producer, you'll do anything. You know, you want to get that sound. I mean, when I work with the Beach Boys and stuff, I mean, we would mic surfboards and hit them with bells and stuff like that. You want to get the sound nobody had. You know, uh, I, I, I always got great vocals and I always had great drum sounds. I mean, I, that I always started with, I mean, Armin I, I, will tell you, sometimes you listen to a kick drum, you listen for six hours, and, you, and a lot of people that don't know, you got to have, you got you to gotta tune the bass, the bass drum. You got to tune it so it's with the bass, the guitar. Otherwise, it's not going to sound right. So there's a lot of records out there that, that people, that these groups do, they don't know that you should really be in tune, <laughs> you know. Uh, why it was called The Rain, The Park, and other things is, it was all called I Love the Flower Girl, it's coming out in three days, and the president of MGM calls me over and he goes, his name was Mort Nasser, and he had a, and he had a hand that was like this, and if, if you didn't flinch when you shook hands, you had a record deal with Mort, and you would have your way. And if you flinched, he wouldn't even go near you. He'd throw you out. Mort says to me, Artie, the Scott McKenzie record, if you go into San Francisco, you know, wear flowers in your hair. He says, you can't call this I Love the Flower Girl. I need a title. And out of nowhere, I just said, oh, the rain, the park, and other things. And I was joking. And they said, it's long, but I think that's great. I said, what, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's very long, you know? <laughs> I don't even know what it means. You know, honestly, I don't even know what the song means yet. You know, now, I, now when I want to bullshit, I tell a woman it was a prediction of my wife's death and my daughter's death. It was a prediction of Woodstock, and I don't know if that's true at all. But, it, you know, I think about it and I listen to the song because I'm proud of the vocals and, 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 the, and the harmonies on that record. You know, because I sort of, Brian Wilson's a friend of mine, and Brian said, you know, you almost, you almost, got, you almost caught me with good vibrations, and that was like, I couldn't believe he said that, you know. You know, so I, that was like one of the best compliments I ever had. He said, the homies you got was so incredible. So I had the councils, and then the father was an alcoholic. You know, the kids never got paid one penny in royalties, and they, and they, and they made $50 million. The father took all the money, and he went to Mexico. I set him up to be the council family, and the, that's how the Partridge family happened. And the father insisted that the mother 
replace Shirley Jones. They wanted to bring in Shirley Jones to play the mother. On the record, there was only the four boys. I didn't want Susan singing. I didn't want the mother singing. I wanted to build the four kids as they grew up into another Beatles, because they had the voices to do it. And we had the writing ability to catch up. You know, because John told me the Pied Piper. Oh, well, that's another story. That's a, Finish this and we'll go to the Pied Piper. Well, that's in the Pied book. Pipers. And I mean, buy the book if you want to. All right, buy the, the, buy the book. Then you, could, then you could find out how John Lennon peed on my leg, and that's how we met. <laughs> and that's true. That's a true story. <laughs> and Paul McCartney I met when I pulled his bathing suit off in the swimming pool. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about Tracy Chapman, your post Woodstock career, which is pretty amazing, Neil Young and Tracy Chapman? Well, Neil Young, Tracy Chapman... Uh, who else, Mo? God Almighty. Mo, do you want to? Well, should we I have mean, Mo's? The Cornfeld Projects usually had 16 of the top 20. I was usually on 16 of the top 20 rock records in the country every week. Right, Mo? Yeah. That, that's, that's a fact. You, know? you want Moser to come over and, and you guys can talk a little bit here? Yeah, come on over, Mo. Sit down. One of my best friends, Andrew Bruce Moser. <laughs> Lost words, so here's Bruce Mosher, and we fought a lot of battles together. You know, uh, he always said to me, Woodstock was not your greatest promotion, Tracy Chapman was. You know, that was the miracle in the record business because, uh, you know, rock radio was not playing females, they definitely weren't playing black females, and they definitely weren't playing songs about a revolution. So, right, you know, th that record came out and if it wasn't for him, that record would have never came out. And that was a labor of love, and it took a long time. I already hired me and about four or five other people. No, six. Six other people. Yeah, it was eight of us working the record. Fast and, Car, it was called. And it was a real slow project. You know, got a few ads every week. And, just and I was hating these guys because I was running it. <laughs> and every week in the conference called, Bruce, how many did you get? Well, I got one. Uh, Ronnie, how many did you get in Dallas? And the text, oh, I got two. And I'm saying... <laughs> And I'm getting paid a fortune to do this, and I'll tell you why, how it works. Um, so finally, I said, I'm going to get off my ass, and I'm going to pull in some stations, too. And I said to the guys, if we don't have stations next week, you know, we're dead. It was a team effort, and yeah. it just, uh, again, proves that, you know, record companies almost have to be intimidated going after records, because yeah. Electra would have walked. Walked away from their well, record the was a long not, time ago. They were told not, they to, were work told the not to work the record because Charles Koppelman, once again, my mentor, he, it was his company. And I didn't know at the time that Charles had a deal with EMI because he was the publisher in the production company that if she went number one rock, he, they would buy his company for $60 million and give him a 10-year deal to be chairman of the board of EMI Records. So that's why it was so important to him to go number one, for that record to go number one. And I never could figure it out. I found out after, but he certainly, he certainly compensated me very well. I, I, I fought because I didn't want him to put Revolution out as a second record because there was a song called All You Got Is Your Soul on that album. And that's what you should have come with second. I, I, didn't think, I didn't think radio was ready to have a black chick singing about a revolution at the time. And that song's just been covered by somebody recently. Revolution, Fast Car, uh, All You Got Is Your Soul. soul. Yeah. yeah, it was actually, I think it was a minor hit somewhere, you know. Uh, yeah, that's another battle, the battle, the battle of radio play. And that's why I did the radio show. And my friend Pat Scully, you know, does a lot of work with me finding bands all over the place. You know, it was funny. I got two records from Beijing, and you know what? You know what they're playing? The bands are playing in China. They're playing like '70s hair band music. That's what they're into in China now. It's really crazy. They, like I did the I did Kicks, the Extreme, TNT. I did those bands. We worked. We worked Queens, right? Right. We worked on that record. You know, and ZZ Top. We worked on those records, right? We worked yeah. on a lot of records. Yeah. And another great effort by Artie was. You know, Neil Young, who's one of his favorite, one of my favorite. You know, Neil had kind of peaked in uh, his last few albums, hadn't done real well. And Elliot Roberts, uh, Neil Young's manager. Well, he was Tracy you know, Chapman's manager. Yeah, also, so that's yeah. why he called me. So he called Artie and said, We got to put Neil back on the radio. So 
already well, put together his team. And well, let me tell them what happened. I go over there, and there's Neil, and there's Elliot, and they play me rocking in the free world, and Neil says, Artie, um, I said, Neil, why are you playing me this? This is the number one record. He said, you know what? I never had a platinum album. I said, well, Neil, you got to have two hits on a record to go platinum. You can't go platinum unless you have two hits, and you've only had one hit, Heart of Gold, or what else? Uh, well, that was his big hit. Yeah, that was his big hit. You never had two hits. I, he said, I'll pay you whatever you want, and, you, and, they, and, then they, and, then they, and then he gives me a letter of intent where he tells Reprise Records, you do not promote this record, Artie Kornfeld's a record company. And every check that, that I paid the Came guys, directly from Neil right Young. from Neil and Peggy Young's bank account. And I'm talking about, I probably went through $300,000. Or, yeah, and half the people didn't want to cash the checks. I didn't want to cash it. I didn't cash yeah. them till the end, until I knew that Neil, because of that happening, you know, what happens behind the scenes, the reason Neil and Elliot wanted that is that they had a deal that if he went platinum, they were going to give him a, a million dollar 12 record album deal and give him his own label. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was the reason. But anyway, I loved Neil and I really felt guilty but what was fun was going with Neil to the bridge concerts and hanging out with Neil and the guys. I brought the Hollies over in 64 or 5 for Morris Levy when I ran roulette. That's when I worked for the mob. <laughs> that, that was the mafia side of the business. And, uh, and we brought the Hollies over. And uh, so I've been friends with Graham Nash. And, you know, we're still friends. You know. But I sort of am friends with my cat, Boo Boo, because <laughs> he loves me unconditionally. Any questions from anybody about anything? Um, here, if you have questions, we do want your questions out. We can make it like a Jehovah's Witness thing. We could have a poll and a mic. <laughs> I got a question. I got a question. Yo. When you came up with this concept. Which one? Which one? For Woodstock. Right? Oh, yeah. And you started to form this whole thing, and it became something concrete where you're going to have this venue, and you're expecting so many people to show up. You were there for the three days? Yeah, of course, yeah. Okay. I was there, yeah. You were there probably then for the prep. When I closed the movie, after I closed the movie deal, I, my limo broke down, and me and my wife hitchhiked up to Woodstock. Well, what well, I'm curious is, at what point, because I know you guys were up here uh, Wednesday, setting up on Thursday, and at what point in that weekend did you feel that, well, you know, at this point, we've really lost control of so the life of its own, you know, because like <clears throat> one of the things you didn't expect was the volume of people. And not true. You didn't have enough work. Not true. That's not true. Well, that was Michael's job. You got to realize something. Michael's job was at the field. My job was getting him there. But when we asked Rockefeller to close it, I had two million people on the on the freeway still coming. So I guess I did my job as a promoter. <laughs> you know, Michael, if there wasn't enough toilets, you know. You know, and to me, to me, it was my protest against the war in Vietnam. Yeah. Now, I couldn't put that in the ads, but I very sneakily put them in the ads. I also did a very dirty trick because everybody thought it's Woodstock and Bob Dylan lived in Woodstock. At the end of the ads, I closed with like a Rolling Stone, even though Dylan wasn't going to be there at the very end. You know, How does it feel? So everybody thought Dylan would be there. So that was a little, a little trick, you know. It was sort of overkill. Because even without that, uh, no, that was what happened on the field. You know, when all the, when when Michael didn't get the fences up, and actually, well, he was at. They had I, I know the whole story. Believe me, he was my he, he he was my partner. <laughs> you know, he yeah, he told me everything going on. Um, they were working on it, but they were two days late getting them up. They should have been up two days before the date even. And actually, the drugs that showed up. I, the tickets I sold when I ran the ad, believe it or not, were all to college kids and were all to upper middle class neighborhoods because I advertised in the Village Other and I advertised in the New York Times. And you know what? I did it around the country just to test. And the, and the tickets that were bought were bought by college kids from upper middle class families. When the fence came down, every freeloader hippie out there came running because it was free. And that's when the drugs really showed up. The college kids smoked a little pot, and that was it. 
And that's the truth. So the, what the press said, don't forget Nixon, was, I was fighting Nixon the whole time. And what the press said was really what the government said. But it went from hippies mired in mud one day to miracle in the Catskills the next day. And it was a miracle. And it was a miracle. So anything you ask me, all I could say is it worked. Because we're talking about it. And, and like I said, Time Magazine made it the second greatest event in mankind's history. I think about the only problem that was up there was the brown ass. Uh, I, 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 well, I didn't take it, so I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know what Osley gave me, so I can't really say I didn't take it. I don't know. Uh, well, you know what? That was their trip, you know? But the fact is, there wasn't one fist fight. Two people died. One fell, off, one fell off the scaffolding and broke his back. The other guy was sleeping. And we had a, when, when the rain came, the, the, the crew didn't get the water. And Yasger was at fault, too. He wouldn't let us put the pipes down lower because he didn't want to erode the field for his cows the next year. So the water pipes broke. So we had to go to the, this is where the National Guard became our friends because they were us, only in uniform. And that's, we had to get the water. The National Guard was bringing trucks in with water. And there was a guy sleeping. And you know, when the sun is not up yet, the guy was sleeping and one of the trucks ran him over. But. I have a place in, in Delray Beach where I live, and I've been ordering pizza for nine years and Italian food. So last week I decided I'm gonna drive up there. It's only two miles. So I order a pizza and I walk in, and the guy making the pizza, and it's great pizza, it's like New York downtown pizza. And I walk in and the guy, the guy making the pizza is, is he says, I'm George. I said, he said, I've been waiting nine years for you to finally come in. I said, why? He said, I am one of the people whose child was conceived at Woodstock. <laughs> I couldn't believe it, man. It blew my mind. And, and, he, and it was a great pizza he made that night. <laughs> Do you have a question? Yeah, well, you, an, you answered one of them. Excuse you me? Answered, you, you answered one of them, because uh, I was going to ask, because everybody talked about that Woodstock is, this is a city because we're having a baby here, and that's one of the one of the. Um, but the one thing is, we had three hundred thousand people out there, and it was a question like, how did you feed every single three hundred thousand people? We saw we what we did is, what the deal I made with all the revolutionary groups. Remember, I had made a deal, and that deal was that if food ran out, we would feed people. Yes. That was the deal I made. So what we did is we would, we would drop, we were dropping rice, we were dropping whatever we could. From, we had every helicopter you could rent in New York State, was, we, we had. I think we had 32 helicopters working for us. And we were dropping food, we were dropping blankets, we were dropping whatever we could to help people. The X, even. The uh, only way the X could get there were by helicopter. Yeah, most well, of the, yeah the the, we had to fly in all the X because you couldn't get there. You know, so, uh, yeah, we had to, we, we, we dropped the food. One last food. question is that Woodstock was really, because when I grew up, because my, my older brothers and that, they were in college, like you were saying, that because the, the, cause we, the this college and also Buffalo, New York, and we have another college in this county is called um, Jamestown. And the tickets were out because back my, my, my oldest brothers were graduated in, seven, um, in, uh, he graduated in 68 and then they were going, and then they said <coughs> they were passing out these tickets in high school. And we said, well, you know, the, the college kids were giving them to other people in the college. And they said, well, but the, the uh, Woodstock was basically I mean, I don't know if, if I'm correct or not, but it was basically to stop Vietnam. Yes, sir. No? I was the, that was me. I was the only partner. In fact, Elliot Tiber in that ripoff book, The Taking of Woodstock, it's all bullshit. My, I, Michael did an interview, so Michael's the only one in the movie. I refused to do it. You know, in the hardcover copy of the book, he said Artie Kornfeld was the only visionary, and it's true, because I was really doing it to stop the war in Vietnam. It was my protest. And also, I wanted to hear all this music. I mean, I wanted to be backstage with all these people. I mean, I wanted to get to know a lot of these people I didn't know. So it's, um, uh, 
I, it didn't stop the war in Vietnam, but it certainly showed that there was a new generation coming. And that's why I said at the Summer of Love, you dropped the ball, you know? Would there, would there ever be another Woodstock? No, event? Woodstock was a miracle. Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, today in this generation, there probably never will be. Well, I'm, I may do a concert in July in Ohio, and uh, I may call it the Rain in the Park and other things, and you know, <laughs> I'll promote it, and it'll be, and then it's gonna, it's gonna, I'm gonna aim for families and college kids, you know, and uh, if it comes together, fine. If not, that's fine too. You know, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. Hi. Um, Hi. My question is, after everything's all finished, you know, everything from Woodstock is like done and over, what was it like waking up the next morning? Well, like, okay. I woke up to Jimi Hendrix, okay? <laughs> I, and I got, went on stage and I heard Jimi play, and then Michael stayed there to clean up the grounds, and I had to fly in the helicopter in New York to meet with Citibank, because already the other two partners, you know, families were freaking out, and I had to fly with my wife and Albert Grossman, who managed everybody. He managed Richie Havens, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix. He managed everybody there, right? He managed not Jimi and Hendrix. And Dylan, that wasn't. And he managed Bob Dylan, and he managed he managed everybody, and he was a friend. So it was Albert, myself, and uh, Bert Summer, who I produced, and. Um, and we, I had to go to the Citibank. It was so crazy, because here I am, full of mud, and Wall Street just let out, and I landed at the East Side Heliport. I'm walking up, and people are walking down from Wall Street, and I'm covered with mud in that vest and my jeans, and my wife's covered with mud. And then Michael ripped off my story in his book, because I'm the one who walked in, and the guy's throwing chopped meat into a piranha tank. And I go, oh my god, this is what I'm heading into now. And uh, it, was, uh, it was very tense, and that battle lasted for about three months until I, you know, uh, I knew I, we could win, win the battle. Warner Brothers did not want Michael and I to win the battle for Woodstock Ventures because they knew that if John and Joel got Woodstock Ventures, they would only want the million four that they were in debt. The deal I made was 50% of the gross of the movie. So Warner Brothers said that they would not get involved and Theodore Keel is one of, was one of the biggest litigators in New York. He did the New York Times paper strike. And um, we went to him and he said, we got him. He said, we know that they were negotiating. They said they were gonna stay neutral. They wanted Joel and John to get it because they saved themselves about $60 million because Michael and I would have got about 60 million. But you know what? I said to Michael, at that point, Theodore Keel said, we need 50,000 more because we got to pay these investigators a lot of money. And I said, you know what, Ted? Let's just drop this because I don't want to ruin the name and I don't want it in the press that we're fighting over the Woodstock. Let's just leave it the way it is. And, and, we, and I walked, you know? If you can walk from $10 or you can walk from 20 million, it's the same thing. It's money, that's all it is. It's just a different figure. And it, it, money can't buy you love. That was Could a be a question, song. But I do want to say thank you for everything you've done. Oh, thank you for being here. I mean. So, I'm really honored to be in your presence right now. I know. Um, well, we're all friends already. You know that. I know. I know. <laughs> but, um, you know, when I was growing up, it's just like, just hearing the stories from my family and like hearing of Woodstock and, you know, I didn't really ever research into it. And then here you are. And. It's really cool to, you know, hear how real you are. And if you had um, two things you would say, what would you want to see happen with the music industry? And what is the legacy that you want to leave behind? What do I, I'd like to see happen with the music industry is I'd like to see radio open up again, you know, and not just be payoff. Because I mean, you know, I, I'm just, it's just my opinion, because I don't want to get sued, so I'm saying it's my opinion that radio is bought by the big record companies. And that's why the independent bands can't get played. And that's why our show we do is independent bands, so they can get heard. So I, that's what has to happen. I, I, I'm try, what we're trying to really set up is a network, like this week we have on Muddy Water's son. He's going to be on, you know. 
Then I had Kenny Aronoff, the drummer, who played on Jack and Diane, you know, and all those records. You know, and Scully, you know, listens and filters through, you know, we get hundreds and hundreds of submissions every week. Gord Downey from the hip? Yeah, we're going to have Gord Downey on from the Tragically Hip, you know. And then a new singer-songwriter that's out of Nashville from Georgia, Jefferson Grizzard, who you just saw the other night. Right, day. right. And then, and, then, and then I bring on my friends. I brought on, I brought on Denny Zywell, the drummer from Wings, you know, and I brought on Will Lee, who's the Fab Four and the bass player in the Letterman Band. And I brought on some of the musicians I played with and I work with, you know, and that's always good too. But I covered Woodstock at the, in the first year until I made the decision what I'm really for. This is my dream. My dream is that this generation you got to save the world because we really screwed it up. Our generation screwed it up. And the generations that followed, the yuppies, they screwed it up after us. We were the hippies, they were the yuppies. So that you're, you're two generations or three generations away. You have, a, you have a fresh start in a really messed up world. So I'm really pulling for you guys to, you know, to do it. I'll be gone. I'll be in another place. And I'm not afraid of that place because I meditate, I chant, I do everything I can to protect myself. <laughs> when you get gray hair, you start meditating and chanting. <laughs> no, I've been doing it for 20, 30. I've been meditating. Hey, John, John Lennon got me into meditating a long time ago. One more quick thing. Um, is this your first time to Fredonia? And if so, what, what has been your favorite experience here so far? Uh, this, hanging with you guys yesterday, and, and this. This is, this is the best part. This is why. Uh, the best part was really coming to do the Mary Moser benefit. That's why I came, you know, and that's what it was all about, you know, because this man, this man, I mean, when this guy got hurt and, and he was out, he was almost in a coma for a year, right? Not quite that long. But yeah, but a long time. And then he got back and I was calling his wife and once in a while she'd give, put the phone near his ear and I'd hear him re react once in a while. And then, and then his wife went down and fell down the stairs and broke everything. And she's been in a coma for seven months. So when, when Bruce said he was doing a benefit and when I come in and, and host it, you know, and talk, I said, yeah. And then Armin got involved and, 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 and the, this came in. But I really came to raise money to keep Mary Mosher going. No. Thank you. Those of you who are at the uh, at the benefit, I've never seen the town so full of people. That's oh, the, the beautiful thing packed, about uh, Buffalo, the support. I almost and it just fell proves down. the spirit of Woodstock still alive. Yep. Yeah. So. It, Hi. Um, I want to bring this conversation. Hey, don't walk out before the miracle happens. <laughs> that's a 12-step that's a, that's a, a saying. Uh, I just wanted to bring the conversation briefly to a more local level. Um, one of the most anticipated events in Fredonia this year is Fredstock, and it's largely inspired by Woodstock and the work that you have done. And I just want to know what advice you have to patrons and supporters and organizers, even band members, that might be in the audience that would like to, you know, better their experience. Well, it depends on which Fred stock you're talking about. Fred's. The one that's trying to be put, put together or the one that's been going on? The one that's trying to be put together. Well, I'm for the one that's been trying to, that's being tried to be put together right now. <laughs> I don't like what the other one stands for. You know, particularly, I, I just don't like what it stands for. Yeah. I don't like, you know, it's, it, a concert shouldn't be a drunken brawl, you know? Concerts should be people who love music and love each other, you know, and, you know, it's all about sharing an experience. You know, if you get a lot of selfish people that are just into themselves, you're not gonna have a concert. If you got a lot of people that are coming to take the ride together, then you have something special. So I'm pulling for it. Two questions for you. One okay. is with uh, Woodstock and you know, with now more modern concerts with Bonnaroo and Glassbury and uh, Coachella, what are your thoughts on these modern festivals that are going on? Well, I think they're commercial big money makers and they have nothing to do with Woodstock at all. 
And anybody who claims they have any connection with Woodstock is full of it because they don't. Because I have no connection with it. And I did it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's people with a lot of money paying bands much more than they should get because we're in a recession. And I, I couldn't understand how, and some of them are friends of ours. You know, one, one in particular, how you could charge $200 a ticket when people are starving in half of the country, it, it amazes me. You know, it would seem like the big acts would be going out playing for $20 a ticket, you know, a couple of shows every, every once in a while. Because with my acts, once in a while, I would, I would, if there was a happening, we call them happenings, I would bring a band up, set up a stage, and, and, and go to, someone would have a farm, they'd invite 3,000 people, and we'd set up a stage, and I'd bring the sound, and my band would play, you know? And it was, that was free, and I'd get to sleep in a barn for three days, you know? And then someone would say, hey, did you try this yet? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with big record companies kind of controlling radio and controlling some of the, most of the popular music scene now, and with some of the developments of independent record labels like uh, Third Man with Jack White, where do you think they could go and where do you think they should go? Well, some of my friends are very successful. My friend Danny Glass has, what does he have? He has um, Bruno Mars. And another friend of mine has uh, the other group that's huge. Uh, oh, I forgot the name, but they, I saw them on, on, on. A couple of the guys who work for me have huge records out right, right now. Uh, the labels are just, um, I mean, if you want to buy into the American Idol and and the voice and all that, you know, if you think that they're legit, then congratulations. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I know the people behind them and I just can't believe these people don't know who's gonna win. Because a good person's not gonna put up a million dollars up front to put out a record, and I don't wanna mention his name, but he's not very liked in the business. You know, you're not gonna put up a million dollars and not know who's gonna win that concert. You're not going to put out a record by someone that you don't want. So if you want to believe that they're legit, go ahead. My opinion is they're not legit. And I know because I had an act, and I was offered by, a by the company who produced one of those two shows that my act could go right into the finals and do nothing else. That was Davin, and that was the boys. And I, and I, uh, and I, and I, and I passed. I had a pass because, first of all, my act wrote his own songs, didn't need any help from anybody, didn't need somebody to tell him how to brush his teeth, you know? And if he didn't have the habit, like Southern Acts, of drinking too much Jack Daniels, he'd be on the charts now with me. But I wish him all the best of luck. He's a great singer. His name is Davin McCoy. And um, I, di I did his album, and, it, and it's out. Uh, but I'm separated. I have no financial... I mean, I wish him all the best of luck. But, uh, but I, I, I was told that he could go right into the finals. So I question these, these shows. I just want to say thank you for being here. It's um, really wonderful to hear the story. Um, I have an interest in the visual arts, and I was, this logo up here is very iconic. And the story you're telling, and for someone who hasn't been there, it really forms that story, seeing this um, historic label. And I was wondering if you could tell me about this? Well, Michael came to me with this ridiculous thing. He wanted to call it, we had a big battle. He wanted to call it the first Aquarian Exposition. I had to let him know, this is not the age of Aquarius yet, Michael. It's, four, it's 40 years away. And then he comes up with this poster of this, the famous water bearer with the girl, with, with the girl, pretty girl with the water dropping out of the thing. And I said, what does that have to do with what we're doing here? What, yeah, I said, you're, now you're back to being a head shop owner. You know, <laughs> sell that in your head shop, but I can't, we can't use this as a poster. And then Skolnick showed up and, and it was just sort of like, um, I just said, I said, because that was my thing. And Michael and I both did it, you know, and it was sort of like, let's make it real simple, you know. And I just said, well, the symbol of peace to me is a dove, you know. And my, I also have, you know, one of only 100 Dove guitars that were made. Johnny Cash and I got them the same day together, actually. You know, so, uh, and I love my, my Dove, so, you know, and you know what a Dove is, so yeah. it's like, uh, uh, and uh, Skolnick just came up with this. He just walked in, and I just went, wow, that's it. You know, and then when I, and then I just said, let's just call it three days a piece of music. 
not an Aquarian exposition. And then I just threw on music, art fair, just for the hell of it. Because it never was, it, it was never going to be an art fair. I don't know, I don't know why I threw it on there, but uh, I don't think it drew an extra two people. <laughs> John Topper. Um, I was wondering if you had a list of bands that you were going after at Woodstock, and did you try to get somebody like the Stones and the Beatles to ever come? And also, how'd you get Shine and Not? Like, what made you decide to put Shine and Not on it? And, then, well, I, and my last question is, what was your uh, what was your reaction to Joni Mitchell's Woodstock? Like the first time you heard that? I thought it was great. You know, I, I thought it was amazing that she wasn't there and she captured the feeling so well. But she was very close with Graham, and Graham's a wonderful guy, and he described what was happening. And, and she wrote what Graham, what Graham, how Graham described it. She wrote it in her words. Shana Na, I helped, I got him their record deal. And I put him on because that was the roots of rock. What they were doing was, was 50s and 60s music. You know, at the hop, the stuff that, that, that the, the people, you know, that the musicians that were happening had listened to when they were kids. So I thought, I thought it was ridiculous. It was bizarre to me to have them there. But when I saw what they did, and I saw the movie, it really showed where the roots were, you know? And also, they all, you know, people don't realize, they all went to Columbia University. They were all brilliant students, you know? And I got them their record deal, because my friend owned Buddha Camera Sutra Records. So I got them the deal. So, of course, when they came, I put them on. Were I couldn't... Any, were there any bands that didn't make it? That you wish uh, you tried we didn't want the doors. Michael says that he talked to him. I don't know if he did. I didn't want the doors, because I didn't want a guy that just exposed himself two months before. <laughs> you know, with, I, I knew at that point, by the, by the traffic reports, I knew there was going to be an awful lot of people. You know, and, and, and just by the ticket sales. I asked, I called Bill Graham, I said, Bill, I just sold 100,000 100, tickets and it's three months away. What do you think will be there? He said, over 300,000. And that's what Bill Graham told, told me. So I, and, and I believe, because he knew he was really a promoter. I was not a concert promoter. I'm a, I'm a songwriter, record producer. One band that's on the poster that wasn't there was Jeff Beck. Tell him why Jeff Beck wasn't there. Oh, I don't know why Jeff Beck. Do you know why? The band broke up like a week before. Oh, right. They broke up. Or something, I think. Yeah, they broke up. Right. I would have liked to. The Beatles, I don't know. I was friends with Paul and John separately. We had different relationships. It's in my book. I mean, and it's really, they were good relationships. Paul, unfortunately, fell in love with my wife, my late wife, and uh, John and I met in the studio. Uh, I put his band together for him for Imagine and the double album. They were my musicians that played on my albums. Um, hi, Ari. Hi. Um, so you, you say our generation is the generation. Yes. What do you want to see from our generation? I, I, I want to I, what I, my hope is for your generation is that, that when you get out of here, that you really follow your dream and don't quit. And, and you have to be, you really have to be persistent because, you know, it's, it's tight out there and uh, you really got to, you really got to develop your skills because when I was in Korea, you know, in Korea, the kids there were complaining to me that they have a thousand hours in high school, they have a thousand hours every year more than American students. And they were complaining about that. But when you take a look, look where the outsourcing is going. In India, also, they have like a thousand hours more. Did you know that? Yeah. What I'd like to see from your generation is to make that gap up in college and really develop your skills past that. Because I don't know if just a bachelor's is going to make it anymore. You know, I think you got to go, I think you got to go as far as you can go, you know, and never take no. And it's a lot of hard work and paying dues not to be self-entitled and just expect somebody to hand you the keys to their car. Yeah, right, because you know, you'll, you'll, get, you'll, get, you'll get your Lexus 450. <laughs> we'll do two more. I have, to ask, I have to ask a couple of local music questions just because it's what I do. Okay. Buddha Kama Sutra, did you ever have any connection with the road? They were the Buffalo no, band. No, but I, every partner in Kama Sutra I knew very well. In fact, the chairman of the board is still one of my best friends, Philly Steinberg. Artie Rip was my partner in Survivor. And Jaime Rai, he disappeared, went to jail somewhere for something. 
And second thing, did you ever work with Tommy Tedesco on the Hitman group? Tedesco and Pittman and those guys? Yeah. yeah, it was a very, you know what? In the 60s, it was a very small world. You know, there was maybe 200 people that produced all the hits and wrote all the songs. That was it. You know, until the British, until the British invasion happened, it was the Brill Building days, we called it. And, you know, when it became famous, you know. And, you know, I was really proud because I was on a list of, of, the, 20, of 20, the 20 men who created the, uh, the, the music industry and the rock culture. And I mean, I was shocked to be there because there was Jerry Wexler who owned Atlantic and Lou Adler, and I, I couldn't believe I was even there with these guys. Because to me, I'm still looking up to these guys. You know, it's like, I, I, I'm, st I'm still arty and I'm still crazy and I still don't know what I'm gonna do when I grow up. You know, but I'm not stopping. Because I can't stop. I tried. I, I'm, I'm waiting to go in the studio again. You know, so I'm still f tracing my dream. And Woodstock is, uh, that's always in my heart. It's like a child. And seeing you here is seeing the child grow. And I've been predicting this, and everybody said, you're crazy. And I said, this is going to stick around, because there's going to be, there's going to be a group of college kids at a certain point that are going to pick up on what Woodstock meant and they're going to embrace it and carry it forward. And then, what is it about? Caring about your fellow mankind, doing all you can to help your fellow man. And also, it's OK to have your piece of the pie, too, as long as you share it. All right. I wanted to acknowledge uh, when, when um, Artie was talking about ZZ Top or promotion, another legend we have in the crowd, Rich Sargent, right over here. Oh, another yeah, local Rich is Buffalo right. legend. Well, I didn't even see us. I didn't see you though. I didn't even know you were there. By the way, I hate to, uh, if you're going to buy Artie's book out there, do it now, because they're going to leave. But go slowly, but we're going to... No, I'm going to tell you something about the book. I'm wiped out because he, he ran me rag in the last two days. So I'm sort of wiped out. And I, and, but I knew as soon as I saw you people, I would get the spirit. You gave me the spirit. Anybody who gets the book, just get my address and just send it to me. You know, and, and just re get return postage, and I'll sign it personally to you. Okay? I will, I will do that. I'm just too wiped out to sit there because I can't just sit and say Artie Kornfeld. I have to take each person's name and say something different than I wrote before. And that means I'll be sitting there for two hours. As you can tell, I'm shot. You know? But anybody who does get the book, and you know what? I turned down a lot of money to publish it, I published it myself. And, uh, and, it's, and it's not just about Woodstock. It's a lot of stories on the inside of the rock, the whole rock trip, you know. It's about life and death. It's about drugs and sobriety. It's about a lot of things. And it's about success. Keep, uh, keep your eyes and ears open. We're going to have a, a panel next semester of probably four or five of the of the legends of the Buffalo music industry. You will see Mosier, you will see Rich Sargent. This man promote, revived CZ Top's career, in addition to being one of the main promotion people at Sire Records. Rich we is a legend. We did do a few things, yeah. What? We did do a few things. Rich is a legend. And so we're gonna, we're gonna. Rich is a great guy and, and was a great friend to have, always. From back before the, from back when you sang Fight Fighter. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had the first hit of the Pied Piper. Oh, I was on the Sunny and Chair. I got you, babe, tour. And I got to play for over 10,000 people 25 times. Seven songs. It was amazing. And that, you know what? That's where Three Dog Night got formed. Because the opening act of the I Got You, Babe tour was Danny Hutton. And the backup band was Corey Wells from Rochester, The Enemies. And that's where Danny and Corey met. In fact, I just had Corey Wells on my show because we're very good friends. And Chuck Negron came, came later, you know. So that's how Three Dog Night got formed. Anyway, I wish you all the best. I really do. And, you know, and Artie's I'm, right about you guys. It's the absolute truth. I'm counting on you guys because, it you know, really I'll be It really is true. And do some research because the old is forever new. 
And there's some... This world is right for all the things that were in place when he started writing and creating things and making stuff out of nothing. And I saw the Calcillos live, and they were really good. That's when I first met you. When the, we, the record company did some things back then they don't do now. And they took us to Cleveland, and we met you there. And then through Denny Zeitler, we met uh, you with Bert Summer. And then we all worked together at Gulf and Western. Right. Yeah, no preaching. You guys know what you got to do. You know, you have it together, probably more together than we have it. You should. There's evolution. I mean, I'm sorry if you're a Tea Party person, but there is evolution. <laughs> I, I remember when I was a lizard. Artie, thank you. My pleasure. Get you back.